recap just maybe two minutes of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about breakthrough. Um, and I want to talk about the concept of breakthrough in a couple different um, levels. And I want to look at it on a couple different levels. How many of you guys know breakthrough is very, very, very important? Yeah. Amen? The challenge when we talk about breakthrough is sometimes in the church and in teachings and things, we allow things to become cliched terms to the point that they're almost watered down. We get so familiar with them that they're not really part of our culture. They're part of our terminology, but a lot of times they're without power. So we can talk about breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough so much to the point we're not really contending. We're just learning about it. Does that make sense this morning? And I want to encourage us this morning. We're not here to learn about the Word of God. We're here to experience the Word of God. Big difference. The word was given to man, but eventually the word became flesh 2,000 years ago. Amen? There was a Messiah that was prophesied to come. How many of you guys know that it wasn't just important that they learned about the Messiah to come for generation upon generation? Eventually the Messiah had to come and manifest the thing they'd always learned about. So when we talk and teach about certain things in the church, especially things like breakthrough, I want us to understand the importance of something like If you're going to hear it, eventually it's good to know, it's good to learn, it's good to have the Word put on your refrigerator, on your heart, or memorize the Bible, but eventually it's pointless if it's not becoming manifest in who we are. Amen? So, like, for me, I want to not just know the Word of God, I want to experience the Word of God, its power and manifestation over my life. If God died for me to have freedom, I don't want to just learn about the freedom. That's certainly the first step and extremely important to know what He's done and why He did it. Amen? But I don't want to just know what He's done for me. I want to benefit because of what He's done for me. Amen? So, again, challenge us a little bit. If we're not the most happy, crazy people on the planet as believers, then we need breakthrough. Amen? Can I say that? Not to shame or condemn or put any... We all deal with ups and downs and emotional things that we go through, so I, I get that part. What I'm telling you, though, is don't you ever settle for the season or moment that you're in that's less than what he promised as if it's the end result. Because there's breakthrough that gets us to the other place. Amen? Does that make sense? So we talk about breakthrough this morning and probably the next couple weeks. Let's make breakthrough something we're contending for, believing God for, and actually receiving. You've got to take ownership of breakthrough. Amen? So breakthrough is a couple different things. And and I've, I've got to be cautious how we talk about this because you never want to like, um, and I think I'm probably the king of this all the time because of, just the way my brain thinks. Um, But I never want to downplay what other people are experiencing or what I've experienced or what you've experienced in the Lord. Amen? That being said, though, I also don't want to ever allow certain things that just simply aren't there yet to take the place and pull my theology down to the level where I don't experience true freedom. Amen? See, sometimes we talk about breakthrough, and breakthrough really is nothing more than a cycle, and we need to get it year after year after year after year. And so we say, God, we need breakthrough, we need breakthrough, we need breakthrough. And so we come to the altar, we go to the Lord, we get with a team, and and, and hear my heart, that's great. Like, there's certainly a time and place for that, but I'm saying there's a breakthrough that's higher than all the little breakthroughs. I do think all the little breakthroughs combined get us to a certain place and posture, but I do believe that there's a breaking through that God wants to do in our lives that in a moment can shatter a billion breakthroughs that you could fight the rest of your life trying to figure out, but Jesus is really the only answer of. Amen? And so sometimes we're praying for a breakthrough, we get a little bit of breakthrough, and then the next week or the next year, the next month, we're right there. And we need it again. And if I can say it like this... This might be a bad analogy. Don't take this as like a, an insult. <laughs> I feel like I'm having to um, preface too many things this morning that I might say. But how many of you guys know you're not a snake that needs to shed its skin every day or every year? That's not who you are. That's not your nature. The enemy wants us to believe that's who we are. He wants to believe that you're so messed up, so broken down, that you constantly need a new sleeve or new skin from the Lord to feel like you're progressing. When the truth is, Jesus already progressed you to a posture you could never obtain on your own. 
And our goal as Christians, as believers, and what the Word is pulling us to is a life that is manifesting that, not just trying to earn it. Does that make sense? See, you can't get breakthrough by yourself. Amen? You can't get breakthrough by your works. You can get progress, but probably not breakthrough. And like I said, I think it was two weeks ago. You guys remember the door that was on stage? Breakthrough is real breakthrough, not the, not the cycle kind, but real breakthrough is not opening the door and getting through. It's breaking through the door so that there's no way back. See, Jesus didn't die so we could get through life. He died and left his spirit in us so we could break through this life. Does that make sense? And the truth is when you break through something, you don't have to usually go back through that thing and do it again. The example we looked at is when Jesus went to Calvary and died for your sins, the Bible said he only died that death one time. He didn't need to do it again. Amen. You guys are thankful for that. Amen. Which means when he does something, he does it one time. He broke through death. He broke through the sickness and sin of mankind one time. And one time was good enough because he didn't just get through Calvary. He broke through it. He didn't get through death. He broke through death. Amen. Powerful picture. So when I talk about breakthrough, I want that kind of breakthrough. I don't want the breakthrough that's going to leave me vulnerable to the next day having to try to struggle. And there's, a, again, a place for that. We all struggle in war with the flesh, and there's things that are going on in our lives that we don't want to downplay. But I don't also want to make my theology subject to what I see my flesh doing. I always want my theology and my belief to be where the Lord is, not where my struggle is. Amen? If you always extend grace to your struggle, you'll never get to the place where God has called you higher. There's grace for where your struggle is, but it's not grace so that you can stay there. It's grace that pulls you out of where you are. Does that make sense? So how many of you guys want breakthrough in your life? Amen? Awesome. Me and you seven will go for it. Amen? <laughs> yeah, I want breakthrough. Ow! It's imperative that we break through. And I'm gonna, we're going to talk about you saying, well, what are we breaking through? You guys ever have that? Like you hear terms like, man, what are we breaking through? You know, like, and here's the challenge. We're going to talk about it probably a couple different ones today. And I'll preface one more thing this morning. Even in how we teach sometimes the word, because of this enormous big picture call, yet this still very human experience we have, we have this enormous big truth, but we have all these little battles that are everyday life. And so it's tricky sometimes to figure out, okay, where's, where's the big thing that has to happen versus how many small things? Because sometimes God is absolutely using the little, small, tiny battles and breakthroughs and victories in your life to get to an end result of where he's called you to be. Does that make sense? But also sometimes all the little battles and things that we're taking on sometimes are the very thing hindering us from getting there. And so it's imperative we hear the Lord's voice in the process and also recognize what's stopping me or what's propelling me to the promise of God. Amen. I want the promise of God. I don't want to settle for less. I don't want to be a pastor for the next 60 years of my life or, I don't know, 160, however long God wants to plague humanity. I don't want to be here the next 100 years of my life just preaching. And I, I want to see crazy breakthrough on the human family all across the world. Amen. This, there's no other point to do this if we're not contending for what the word promises. Amen. Amen. Psalms 121. Verse number one, it says, I lift up. Everybody say, I lift up. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Powerful 
confession. Amen? See, to me, breakthrough starts when my perspective is settled. If I don't settle my faith, my perspective, my resolve, my belief, if who I say that I am, if my why isn't secure and I can look to God's word and say, okay, this is the standard in which I live by. If I don't first have that building block, then breakthrough will never be real breakthrough. Without faith, trust, and hope in the Word of God, not just the Word of God, but God Himself, breakthrough doesn't work. Self-modification doesn't count as breakthrough. Can I say that? Make us know that mankind fell and it became an issue based on the law and the sin of man of self-modification, trying to get yourself good enough when the missing equation didn't come for, for thousands of years, which was himself. When he shows up, it wasn't about self-modification. It was about modification by someone else being the potter and you being the clay. Amen? So now we get to live this glorious gospel where God is the one empowering us to be what we could not, even if we're not there yet. He is constantly calling us to this perfection and this peace and this prosperity and this life full of hope, not just here but someday, that we don't have to... Now, hear my heart. We don't have to... Get everything right to apprehend. Amen. Amen. In other words, you don't have to be perfect to be perfect. Now, some people would stone me for making that statement in the church. Because they're saying, well, no, 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 no. You got to be perfect. You got to keep, keep the law. Uh, we've taught on this enough here. You can't keep the law if you wanted to. And as long as you keep trying to keep the law, you're going to miss the fact that he's the one who's keeping you. And if you're not allowing him to keep you, you will constantly fail at something when God could empower you. See, I'm keeping the law confidently right now. Like, if I read the law, for the, for the most part, you know, like, and I always think it's funny, again, culture, we, we pick and choose parts of the law that work, you know. So we condemn each other on, like, the highlights, and then we leave all the, you know, the, the background. It's kind of like, like if the law was a football game, the Super Bowl. Everybody watched last week? They only show the highlight reel, usually. A couple, couple highlights are like bad plays, you know, like they miss a catch and everybody's talking about it. But if you took the law and built the highlight reel, that's usually what our version of the law is in the church, right? What we don't include is all the little stuff that disqualifies everybody. And so what we do is we say, well, no, if you've done this in your life, you've done this, or you killed somebody, like God is totally, obviously, just not liking you as a human being, uh, yet there's a way out. And we preach this very contingent gospel based on self-performance, self-modification, and whether or not they can get themselves clean enough to enter into his presence, which defeats the point of the gospel where he entered into your presence, and that was the entire point, that he would rescue you from something you could never get out of on your own. Real breakthrough doesn't come because you got strong enough or you figured out how to do it or because you know what to do or even no one knows what to do in this life. I don't know if you guys know that, but none of us know what the heck to do. Amen? Breakthrough comes because Jesus broke you through. Breakthrough comes because he reached down in a place that you could never get out of and pulled you out whether you liked it or not. Now you have to receive it. You have to manifest it. You've got to take ownership of it so that it works in your life. Amen. But the truth is, I don't struggle with the law because I've allowed him to be my shepherd. Not because I'm good at being a Christian. And... (laughs) I'm not saying we don't contend. I'm not saying we don't fight. What I'm saying is don't ever allow your effort to be greater than his rescue. Never think that your performance outweighs his performance. See, that's foundational for me to be able to look up, especially, this is pre-gospel, this is a psalm of David, like way before the cross. It's even more power for me to lift up my eyes above all the noise, above everything going on, and be able to confess and say, man, God, this is who he is to me. He is my refuge. He's the one who guards me by day, by night, through famine. So all all of these things, like God is the one that I'm under. I'm good. I'm good to go. Not because I'm awesome. Not because I'm Superman in my faith, you know. But because of God. Amen. Breakthrough starts with the origin of breakthrough, which is Him. If it starts any other place, it will be a cycle in your life and you'll never get enough breakthroughs to get to that elusive thing you're not even sure what you're chasing. That's why I said this morning we talk about breakthrough a lot, but sometimes we wonder, what are we really breaking through? 
For some of us, breakthrough is really small. It could be huge, but it seems small. It seems insignificant in the scope of the supernatural and the natural. And so sometimes breakthrough is as small as breaking a habit in your life. How many of you guys know that, like, I'll, I think I've shared this story before thought, but how many of you guys know that, like, sometimes in your life you hit ceilings? Everybody say ceilings. You hit ceilings, and what happens is God calls us higher, right? Sometimes we hit this ceiling, and I know this is true for me on multiple phases and seasons of my life, and, and even now I'm always evaluating, not, not necessarily trying to self-criticize, but always evaluating, God, where am I missing it? And how do I get to where you're calling me to be? I never want to settle down here if my call's up there. Amen? That does take little, challenging breakthroughs. Okay? I know in my life, because I'm here today, and the only reason I'm standing here expounding on the word of the Lord is because there was a big breakthrough in my life, right? So I'm speaking from testimony, not from what I think is right. I would not be here if it weren't for that crazy breakthrough God put over my life. Now, even though that big breakthrough came, there's still been multiple tiny little breakthroughs that are part of the journey. That's where we partner with the Lord, okay? There's these ceilings, though, sometimes we hit where God's calling us higher. And I don't know about you, and it may not, it may not appear that it's maybe working in, in the call of God. Maybe it's like in your career life, your family life, your, maybe your own emotional life, right? We tend to feel like we hit these ceilings and we're stuck. Do you know what I'm talking about? You hit these ceilings, you don't even know what it is, you don't know why it is, you can't pinpoint, you can't define it, but you hit these seasons in your life, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your spiritual walk, whether it's in your emotional stability, maybe it's in your health, maybe it's in your finances, but you hit these little points that are ceilings and you feel like, man, I just cannot get past that point. You might know what I'm talking about. This is the ceiling. And what I've come to find out, especially in my call of the Lord or certain areas in my life, is He's ordained me, He's anointed me to be a certain place in the way that I think, the way that I feel, the way that I function. But the truth is, I'm not always in that place. Anybody agree with that? I mean, for you, not for me. And what I find is sometimes I hit that ceiling because there's small little breakthroughs in my life. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's five. That the Lord's trying to reveal to me so that my heart can be free and not bogged down by all the stuff. Now, does that mean that God can't be the answer and just eliminate all of that stuff? God at any moment can snap a finger and set you free of everything. How many of you guys believe that? If we don't believe that, then you can't have breakthrough. Amen? That's number one. I've got to believe he's sovereign, he's all-powerful, and if he wanted to, he could. But the truth is, he does want to. You just don't always understand how he's going to do it. Amen? And so sometimes he calls me to this place, and I know it's true, I know it's God, and I'll never be settled until I get there because there's some, like, I mean, when, when the writer writes in the New Testament, he says, I'm chasing that I've been apprehended of. He's literally talking about this feeling that something anointed, something captured him, something brushed up against him. It was kind of like Jesus in the crowd. If she could just brush up, he didn't even have to know. If she could just brush up against him, some residue would come off. And sometimes you have an encounter with God so strong that there's, there's not even definition. You don't know what happened. All you know is something's different and you'll never be the same and you'll never be satisfied till you figure out the definition of what took place. And so God touches your life. You don't even know what that means. You just know that it's good. And it's powerful when God touches your life because when breakthrough comes, it's amazing and it hurts like crazy. You know what I'm talking about? If you ever get set free of something, there's pain in the midst of, of the battle. Amen? You feel so good, but at the same time, you're like, ah! I heard a guy say one time, he's like, this, this is how Jesus operates sometimes. And he painted a picture, he said, it's kind of like Jesus holds a sword to your chest and says, come follow me. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's good because it's God, but at the same time, you, it, it's going to be painful to walk through some of the stuff to get there. But here's the encouragement we have in this life and in that journey is that it will never be more painful than what he did for you and I. Amen. His sacrifice will always be greater. We will never fathom 
what he went through. Amen. But sometimes we go through the ceilings and I know God's like calling me higher. But then he starts to reveal certain little things in my life. And for some of us this morning, there may be sin issues that you're just missing the mark. Good news. There's an answer for sin. Amen. For some of us this morning, they may be habits, not even sin issues. They might literally just be a habit that is blocking the way you are entitled to feel based on the Word of God. For you this morning, it may be the way that you think about something. This is usually the number one. I heard a guy say, and I love this quote, we're, we're always one thought away from transformation. Amen? Transformation doesn't come because the world around you got better. Transformation comes because the peace within you got more stable. And the more we think correctly with the mind of Jesus, the more we respond. That's why I say if our perspective's not solved as to who he is and how it relates to me, then anything I tackle has the potential to destroy me because my help's not coming from the Lord. My help is coming from me. Amen? So you've got to decide this morning what your ceiling's going to be. Is it going to be you or is it going to be him? Is the level that I'm reaching for going to be what I can do in this world, or is it going to be Him? Okay? Sometimes we hit these ceilings, we feel trapped, we feel like, man, I just can't go, like I can't level up. If I can use that terminology, it's like a video game, right? I just can't level up like this place I want to get to, like whether it's the Lord or... For, guys, here's the one I hear the most common um, in church conversations, not just here, everywhere. And, and I think it's important we, we have these discussions because, I don't know if you guys know or not, but even though there's this divine sowing that God did in your life, how many of you guys are human here this morning? I know of three of you that definitely aren't, but everybody else is pretty human, right? So if we're not going to be real in our humanity then how do we expect to progress? Okay? But one of the most common things I see in the church usually isn't even sin issues. In fact, that's that's one of the lesser challenges I see in the body of Christ for believers. One of the biggest issues I see that are keeping us from functioning in the life of God always come back to usually emotional issues. Amen? So what happens sometimes is we preach, teach, and sing like God's done this, God's done that, God is good, He loves me, and it's huge and it's powerful, and we absolutely can believe that, but at the same time we believe that, we can be so overcome emotionally that although we believe it and we learn about it and we sing it and confess it, we're not experiencing it. Amen? See, for me and for our church, like my prayer is... God, I want what you paid for. And I want it to be seen by this entire region. Amen? Not to condemn where anybody is. If you're struggling, it's fine. It's just not the end result. That might be your current ceiling, but that's why we're going to break through the ceiling. And you're not going to get around the ceiling and put an attic door in so you can come back down later and still let that be your ceiling. You're going to bust the ceiling out and get to the roof line because that's where he is, seated at the right hand of God. See, the Bible says in Psalms 121, it says, I lift up my eyes. Now, this is written from a guy who had a lot of culture, or not a lot of culture, but a lot of experience of the day of what was going on. A lot of things could have persuaded how he believed. And I'm sure, certain at times you read the Psalms, it's like this. The dude is on a roller coaster with the Lord. I mean, one minute he's like celebrating God's good, this victory. The next minute he is an absolute depressed mess saying, God, where are you? My pain is so big. My enemies are always trying to, like, I just can't take it anymore. The next next verse, he's like, oh, man, this is crazy. God, you're so good. All my enemies are under my feet. You know, like he's like going from crying to cheering. And you got to wonder what is wrong with this guy? And that's the beauty. See, this is how the divine and the human get intertwined. It's got to stamp something on your life that's so crazy, so huge, so anointed, and so blessed. 
yet we're still shedding the curse. And when the two start to operate together, it can get really paradoxical and confusing to figure out what's God, what's me, what's God, what's me. But this is the resolve, this is the statement that he said in Psalm 121. He said, I lift up my eyes. In other words, I could see what they're doing to me. I could see what my enemy's doing to me. I could see that so-and-so betrayed me. I could even see my own stuff and say, man, I'm just not performing on every level that I need to. Or I've got this addiction in my life. Or I've got this habit in my life. Or I've got this like anger problem in my life. And I'm just oh, blah, blah, blah. And we could get all our eyes stuck on all this stuff. But in the midst of all the noise, his confession became, I lift up my eyes to the mountains where my help comes from. And then he goes on. He goes on to talk about who the Lord is to him. That he's the one who's got him. He's the one who's got his back. See, we've got to live a life where we are constantly reminding ourselves who God really is to us. Come on. I do not believe Jesus died so we could have good thoughts about him until we die and get through life. Jesus died and he resurrected to impart the same spirit that resurrected him in you and I. Not so you can get through life, but so you can break through this life and be a light unto men. That they would see there's a greater God than there is a suffering on the planet. And want to run to a father who loves them, not that's conditional based on their performance. See, if we're contending for God's love based on performance, it's because we don't have breakthrough in the way that we think. Which at the end of the day means we haven't agreed with the gospel. Because if you can't really... When we talk about, like, side note this morning, not what I want to talk about. But when we talk about the concept of receiving Jesus, that means you have to receive Jesus. Amen? And receiving Jesus biblically is talking not just who he is, but what he did and why he did it. So when you're talking about, man, yeah, I've received Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. Right? Right? But what does that really mean? If you really receive Jesus, you've got to receive what Jesus did for you. See, that's the part of the journey is you receive the salvation, but you also receive what comes with the package, which is the anointing to not be the same. That part is a journey, amen? But it's a journey we have to take if we're to be the call of God in the earth that he's called us to be. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. Now the people light a lamp, place it on our bowl, they put it on a stand so that everybody in the house can see it. Everybody in the house of Wilkesboro, North Wilkesboro, Wilkes County, the entire region. My contention is, God, I want us to be a light so bright that people just look at it and say, why? Like, why are they that happy? You know? Here's a, here's a good. This is this is what I'm contending for. I want people to look into our lives, look into my life, and say, "Why does nothing bother them?" Like literally, hell could be breaking loose, the devil and his de- all around, and they act like everything's okay. Yeah. The stock market could crash. There could be wars and rumors of wars. The whole world's in a panic, and yet these people are fine. See, part of the why we're after with this whole breakthrough concept is not just your why, but it's the ability for the world to look into the church and ask why. Because once you can get a world that's curious about what manner of man you are, just like Jesus, they'll start to poke around and want to know more. Ah. Uh. I think what we've done too long in those is we've tried to tell them why rather than live a life that gets them to ask it. And when you try to answer a question they're not asking, they're not going to buy the product you're selling. Does that make sense? When the, I know, again, salvation's not a business, but let's use something natural to understand even evangelism. One of the worst failing um, models for business is to tr- to try to create a need and sell it to people. The most successful ones are when you solve a problem because then people already need it and they start to buy it. Here's how this works in our faith. When we become, through breakthrough, 
what Jesus has anointed us to be, they're going to look at us and realize they need the same deliverance. See, your testimony is so powerful because people around you in everyday life, at your job, in your family, in your church, in your relationships, in your schools, people need to hear the testimony of what God's doing and done in your life. Because you say, you know what, man, I was addicted to cocaine and God set me free. Guess what? A cocaine addict's going to hear that and say, oh, man, I need that. And once they've got a need, they've got a why. And once they've got a why, you can start to tell them about Jesus and the anointing and the gospel and how he was raised from the dead and how he paid for their sin so they're no longer in bondage by shame about their cocaine addiction. They can come into the light and say, you know what? Yeah, I've got a cocaine addiction, but here I am. I'm ready to work it out. That's where the gospel shows up. It's not because they got set free and then got Jesus. It's because they got so curious about Jesus that their eyes started to get off of the addiction and started to be lifted up to where the real help comes from, where real breakthrough comes from. They didn't get good at resisting. See, breakthrough doesn't come through resistance. It comes through surrender. When you surrender into his hand and say, you know what, God, take me. Oh, my gosh, it's a different experience. It doesn't mean we don't try. It doesn't mean we don't war. It doesn't mean we don't battle. It just means that we're anointed to do it now because we've had breakthrough. Sometimes we hit this ceiling, we feel trapped, and God's calling us higher. And sometimes it's because of that ceiling that I've got to evaluate in this realm and say, okay, why can I not get past this level in my life? Let's talk about it this way. Why, why is it that maybe, maybe finances for some people, why is it that I can't like, seem to just get a grip on my finances? You know? And we think, well, man, because there's, there's not enough. And the truth is, for some people, some people struggle. You, you're in a tough spot, get it. If there's not enough, there's not enough. Amen? For most of the American culture, there's plenty. Can we be honest? Now, not everybody's the 1%. Not everybody's middle class. But compared to the rest of the world, there's plenty. Amen? Come on. (laughs) There's plenty. And so the fact that we can't seem to save money or or whatever your your budget or your finance goal looks like, the fact that we always feel like we have lack and we hit this ceiling, oh, and when you understand culture defines us, you know the 1%, of the middle class, lower class, all, this, all that is is they're, they're determining where your ceiling is based on how you've produced. That's how the world treats this stuff, but the church can't treat it the same way. When we see no matter what we have, that we have more than enough, not because the banks are good, not because my job's good, not because my boss loves me. When you start to see that it's because I lifted my eyes up because my real help comes from the Lord. And even if I don't have enough $20 bills, I've got enough Jehovah Jireh who can provide anything that I need. Then you'll stop blaming your boss. You'll stop blaming your performance. You'll stop blaming everybody around you who stabbed you in the back or caused you not to get that promotion. Or you'll stop blaming the power company because they just charged you too much or whatever it is. You'll start blaming everything around here and just simply look up and say, you know what? This may be all a mess, but I've got a higher standard. I've got a higher deliverer. I've got a higher ceiling and I'm not going to allow my life, my performance, my emotions to be dependent on what I think I'm in lack of because I'm in lack of nothing because Psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, probably that guy had some areas of his life writing that sentence that could have used a little bit of help. But his resolve, his standard was, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I'm good. Can you, in the midst of feeling like you're starving to death, come to that place of breakthrough and say, you know what? I'm good because God. Can you look at your checking account and say, man, I'm not where I want to be. I've hit the ceiling. Say, you know what? I'm good because of God. But here's what God does. As soon as you accept that he's Lord over your life, under that ceiling, he raises the ceiling. And then what it requires of us, I found, not always, but I found to be part of the journey. What it requires of us is as I want to go higher, whether it's in let's, whatever level it is, as a leader, right? 
So I want to go higher. What happens is God's anointed me. He's always met me where I'm at. He's good. But like a good father, he calls me higher. And so what happens is when I see that ceiling, he starts to have conversations with me and answers this question, why? Why are you stuck under that ceiling? And sometimes, not always, because you can destroy yourself always looking for the little whys. But sometimes God anoints and highlights certain things in your life that are the very reason why you feel like you can't get out of that space. And God may highlight something so simple, so, quote, natural, so, quote, insignificant, but it may be the most spiritual breakthrough that you're waiting on. Amen? Well, God, why can't I get my finances? Like, why am I always behind? And the truth is, again, the majority, not all of us, but the majority is most people have enough. You know what the number one why is? People can't have some kind of just ease in their financial life it's here's the number one why we've got to answer it because until you identify the why you won't understand why you keep doing it why you keep getting that result why do i keep not having why do i keep doing this god why do i keep staying behind you know why because you don't have a budget practical right practical just an example the practical What is the budget? You set parameters, you set certain allowances, and you stick to that, you live by that, and over time it helps you empower your finances so that you're not constantly behind. You don't have to worry about paycheck to paycheck. It takes time to get there, right? I love talking about this because it's it's so practical. People are like, man, let's let's lay somebody out on the floor. You, You know, like, again, I don't want I don't want to like contend for God to do the impossible if I can't do my possible that he's called me to do. And if I'm hitting ceilings in my life where God's highlighting certain things I need to face so that I can learn to be a good steward. If I'm really going to follow the Lord, I've got to follow him and sink in his time. And so sometimes we look and we think, man, I just can't do this. And then we find the wise. Oh, I haven't made a budget good place to start. One why can empower and change your situation. Maybe for you, you have a budget, but you didn't use it. There's another why. Well, I've got a budget. I put it all out, but then you didn't do it, right? Same thing emotionally. How many guys know probably somewhere in your life, and again, you got to be careful with this stuff, and different people work different ways, but How many of you guys know it's probably healthy to have an emotional budget for your life? Amen? You say, man, why am I strung out all the time? Why am I stressed? Why am I mad? Why am I just annoyed at everybody? Why am I trying to kill everybody in road rage every time I go to church? Why am I so upset at work when I clock in that I just don't even want to talk to, you know, like why, why is my emotional bank account so stressed out that I feel behind and owe payments to everybody of kindness somewhere and that stresses me out more. So now I'm just going to file for emotional bankruptcy and I'm just going to hate everybody and die alone. That's where we get to, right? You know why? Because probably somewhere we don't have boundaries. You know what boundaries are? They're like an emotional budget that determines, hey, this is where I'm going to allow my heart to go. This is where I'm not going to allow it to go. And it sets you up so that over time, all the little small victories build a wealth of savings, of happiness, joy, that feeling of victory and conquering. Because if you can't conquer the small things... And chances are, if God sends you over to the Middle East to do some crazy mission things, you may not be able to do it either. And that's why he anoints certain people to go. I say, no, God, send me to the nations. Yeah, but you can't conquer your own nation. See, this is how he is. God's so supernatural, but so practical. Amen. He'll get you to walk on water. But then he's going to turn around and tell you to do something so practical after that. That you might not think it's him. And sometimes the practical victories God's trying to work out in our lives are the things we're praying against. Because they don't look supernatural. See, if you've got sin issues in your life that you're just struggling with, maybe it's temptation. There's a couple reasons. First off, 
we know the one why it isn't. It's not because the cross wasn't strong enough. Amen? So there's our standard. I'm struggling, but it's not, it's not God's fault. And as long as you have that standard, then you don't get to be mad at God later when you're not seeing the victory. Amen? But sometimes the sin issues you deal with in your life are because you didn't make a budget. You didn't make a boundary. Sometimes those boundaries are walking it out with somebody else. Saying, man, I've got this addiction, I've got this struggle, I've got this challenge in my life. I just need somebody to pray with me, walk with me, call me every Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday, and just say, man, how you doing? Like, somebody I can call when I'm feeling tempted. Like, you, you need those kind of boundaries in your life when you're dealing with stuff. Amen? One of the greatest downfalls of the Christian faith is that we are so locked up and not transparent with one another because we're afraid of judgment. That we're not walking in victory on every level that we could be because the enemy's got us so bound by shame. And that's a tragedy. Jesus died and released us all so that we wouldn't have stones to throw at each other. You know, the truth of it is Matt calls me and says, dude, I got something going on. Guess what? Doesn't devalue Matt to me whatsoever. Now, it, let's go down this path a little bit. If, if one of your Christian brothers or sisters, maybe one of your Bible study friends, calls you and says, man, I've been struggling with something the past couple months, maybe the past couple years, and I haven't told anybody. Without raising your hand, how many guys, like this, maybe it's, I don't know, just somebody you never thought. I remember one time I just came to the Lord. And there was this guy that I looked up to, like he was just a he was just a role model, like friend. He was about my same age, and just thought the world of the guy because he loved Jesus. And you know, it was like just I didn't have a, a lot of friends at the time who loved Jesus. I was coming out of the world into like Jesus world, right? And so like you're you're so alone, which was cool. Like God was doing all the sovereign stuff, and like. He was the relationship that I needed first. But as God introduced friends into my life, like Jesus friends, I remember this this one guy one time after a while revealed to me, like I thought this guy was like, just had nailed it. You know, like this dude's like, like he, he's just somebody I can lean on, you know. But I remember one time he came to me and confessed something he was struggling with just for prayer. And the truth is, especially young in my faith and my perspective of grace and what God really did, like, I was devastated. Absolutely shocked. Because the truth is, sometimes we're putting our faith and hope and trust in that person's ability to perform their Christian example rather than you know who. And that's a tragedy because in the church... We should be the first place we can go and not fear judgment. Come on. So for some of us, sometimes our why is because we're not making boundaries or not building relationships that help us get to where we want to be. Just say, you know what, man, things, things with my, my wife, they're just, they're not good. I'm the, the husband I should be. Or maybe you've got an addiction or a struggle. This is the first place you should be able to go. I'm not talking get on stage. That would be inappropriate. But go to somebody and say, man, I just need, I need like companionship in this because I've tried to do it on my own and I can't. It may not even be a sin issue. Maybe it's a character issue you're trying to work out. Maybe it's a habitual issue you're trying to work out. Either way, breakthroughs come when you figure out why. Have you ever been so frustrated? This is, this is one of my favorite struggles. It almost becomes a game. Part of it's the Lord, part of it's my OCD-ness. I don't really have OCD, but as an example. I'm, this is like the question of my life. This is how it came to the Lord, by the way. My biggest encounter with the Lord was like I, I never really, I, again, growing up in church, never really cared. You know, like I, I wanted that kind of thing, but I didn't know what that was. It's like I'm looking for this like breakthrough out of this world into his, but I didn't know what that was. So I go and do the whole world thing and get lost in all that mess. And for me, the, the way I came back to the Lord was this question right here. Because I started to ask like, God, why? 
Do you ever read through the Bible and just really ask the Lord why? So I think, I think sometimes we feel like we're tempting God by asking him why. Guess what? He can take it. In fact, you're not going to really have much of a relationship with the Lord if you can't ask him why. And we say, well, no, you don't ask him why. You're testing him. He's going to smite thee. <laughs> no, no, no. He's your, he's your father. Now, he may not give you the answer. No, that's the funny part. I mean, like, God, why? And he's just like, Ooh. And you sit there for three weeks waiting for an answer, and he didn't answer, and you're just like, well, I don't know why either. I'm just going to do something, you know? This is how I met the Lord, though. Because I started questioning, like, why the world we live in? Like, why trees? Why water? Why, like breathing and i don't have the answers to any of this still but what it did do i question everything why do people die why do people get sick why do governments have to like question every why do we have to eat to live and the why then becomes the where is where did my no this gets Goofy, but I used to ask these questions. Where did my eyeballs come from? <laughs> you know, like, and we know, like, we put this, you know, science has defined it for us, but guess what? They're a little late in the game. There were some answers there before them that we still can't really answer, except for the fact that that why and that where leads us back to Him. And so, what I find out in my life is all these little whys bring me right back to the Lord, who sometimes gives me a bigger why. But when it's him, I know I'm content in the mystery rather than having to know the answer. And when I find myself content in the mystery, I get breakthrough whether or not I know the why or not. Amen? So I come to the Lord with this big why question. And when I first got saved, I I struggled again with that flesh and spirit thing. God gave crazy breakthrough, and I'm just like a different person. At the same time, I'm still the same person and I'm not supposed to be that same person. You know what I'm talking about? So you start like questioning everything. Am I really saved? If he comes back tonight, am I just out of luck? You know, like am I, am I at the right level I need to be to get in? Because any day now, it's all flying apart, you know? And so fear and faith start to war. And in the midst somewhere, it's just God trying to be a father, right? And I used to always ask God, why do I do what I do? You ever get so frustrated because you just like, you, you, you function in a certain, I still do this, you function in a certain way and you don't know why you do it and it makes me so mad. You ever react a certain way and just like, why did I do that? And you're mad at yourself and then it compounds. So where you were mad before, now you're really mad, but you're not mad at the person or what happened or what didn't go right. You're mad at you because of how you reacted to it, Right? See, the challenge is as painful as that is in the midst, the confession is in the statement. The answer, the why is in the statement because sometimes we think, man, God's not doing anything in my life. But the fact you're frustrated with the way that you reacted means that God is in your life. And he's the one that's made you discontent with that reaction. And if you could just identify the why you're feeling that way, why it's compounding, you'll start to understand God's doing something in your life even when you think he isn't. And when you can identify God moving your life in the seasons you don't think he is or under the ceilings you don't think he is or in the cycles or addictions that you don't think he's in the midst of, that's when breakthrough starts to show up. Paul writes in Romans 7, he says, the thing that I want to do, I can't stop doing. Or the thing that I want to do, I can't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I keep doing. And he's talking about, you know, because of that, you know, I see that the law is good. And he's talking about, he goes on to talk about there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And this glorious picture. And you say, okay, which one is it, Paul? Is it about the law? Is it about Jesus? And what he's literally trying to say is there used to be a ceiling. Before Jesus showed up, our ceiling was the law. And so everything was based on performance. We were trapped. We were in cycles. We were always looking for breakthrough. And eventually most of the human family in that nation of Israel got so tired, they knew they could never do it, so they just quit trying. And the guys who thought they were doing it realized later they weren't even close. Amen? 
Nobody was good enough, but the law was the ceiling that everyone was hitting. But the why was the, the fact they could never do it. Jesus shows up, knocks the ceiling out, and shows us the roof line, which is his covering. Okay? So now we're called to a higher place, but the challenge is, even though the veil was torn, has the veil been torn in the way that you approach God? Because if it hasn't, you'll never function in breakthrough. You'll always function in performance. If you're coming to the Lord based on what you've done to please Him, rather than the truth that He is pleased with you, not in everything you do, but God loves you, and he likes you. How many of you guys know that God loves you this morning? Here's the, here's the one that gives us breakthrough and gets rid of that orphan heart and allows us to really take ownership of the fact we're a son or a daughter of God. Okay? Raise your hand one more time if you know he loves you. Don't raise your hand. Let me just ask this question. But do you know why he loves you? the question. Why, God? Why do you love me? Now, I can look back and see my life, compare it to the Word, and obviously realize that's not why He loves me. It's not because of my performance, for sure. Amen? Why does God love me? See, God made you before there was a fall, before mankind messed up, before there was sin, before death dominated, before cancer existed, before murder, before sickness, before disease, before lack, before wars and rumors of wars, before earthquakes, before anything was off kilter, he made you in his own image. The beauty of the gospel is he rescued you Amen. After the fall, he rescued you. You understand that he loves you. Here's the why. You ready? You just got to, when I say this, like, it's going to be so revelatory, first off. But if you, if you can't accept this one statement and allow it to simply be your standard, you will forever struggle with your identity as it relates to the Father. You know why God loves you? Because he loves you. Powerful, isn't it? You thought there was going to be some mysterious golden key, like trick response that just made it all click. No, 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 no. The truth is simply the truth. It's how you react to the truth that determines whether or not it's functioning in your life. So you know what? God loves me. I know it's not on my performance. I'm not even totally sure what it is, but I know that he loves me. And if you know that you know, then you can lift your eyes up above all the noise. Let me read a couple more passages and we'll close. But sometimes we're not getting breakthrough because we're not identifying the why as to why we're stuck where we are. It's not because God hasn't called us. It's not because he hasn't anointed us. It's because there's somewhere in our life that that victory needs to show up so that I can be set free. Amen. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. I'm going to read this other one just to show you a picture again of standard of Psalms 139. Verse number 7. It's in my favorite translation of this verse, but I'll quote some other ones. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. One translation says Sheol, another translation says the grave. I think King James says hell. It says, if I make my bed in hell, if I make my bed in the grave, if I make make my bed in Sheol, you're there. Crazy, right? If I rise on on the wings of the dawn, if I settle 
on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your hand will hold me fast. This is a standard. This is a ceiling. This is a breakthrough. This guy's confession comes from breakthrough. Therefore, when you're under the one who cannot be shaken, it gives you victory on everything that could shake you. So I'm not saying everything, things aren't going to be bumpy. I'm not saying you're going to have challenges. It's not going to be up and down sometimes. It means that in the, at the end of the day, and all the dust and the rubble settles, you're still st- standing and haven't crashed with the world around you because your standard's bigger than the world around you. He says, you know, if I go up to the heavens, there you are. If I make my bed in hell, there you are. Let's look at one more. Important verse because what that tells me is no matter what you're dealing with, You can find God in it. You might be in the deepest, darkest stronghold of your life. You know, the one thing that will absolutely shake that up is when you realize He's there. He may not be partaking in your brokenness or your sin. Oh, but He's there. He was there before you ever broke. Amen? Uh, God's so good. The book of Luke, one of my favorite stories. Looking at breaking through the ceiling one more time. Luke 5, 17 says, let me start in verse actually 18. It says, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, ever say crowd, They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Fascinating. Different story for a different day, but it's fascinating that someone who had a disease or sickness issue, a paralytic, Jesus didn't speak to the disease, he spoke to the sin. In other words, the way the man thought based on who he had always been, because he's under so much guilt and shame, Jesus delivered him from, which manifests something also in his body. A lot of the stuff we're walking through and manifesting in our lives, especially whether it's stress, depression, brokenness, anger, all these things, a lot of time it goes back to how you think about the Father thinking about you. Amen? But they take this guy and they couldn't get to Jesus because the crowd was too thick. Right? So they take him up on the roof. They take him up to the ceiling. And I like this ceiling picture because usually we think, man, I lift my eyes up. i got to break through the ceiling to get to the next level. It's totally important. But what we've got to realize is if we're breaking through ceilings, we've got to understand God's always the roof, right? If you, if you look in your attic right now, unless you have a vaulted ceiling, if you break open your ceiling, you'll realize there's another space above that and you see the roof. So sometimes we think, man, it's raining really hard. Thank God for the ceiling. But it's really thank God for the roof, the part that I'm not seeing. Because I'm only seeing what I'm seeing, but there's something higher than what I'm seeing, right? Well, they take this guy up to the roof because the crowd was too thick. The noise was too crazy. This guy's got a sickness, right? And so it's a little bit rowdy scene. And they take him up. Jesus is below. And they break through the ceiling and lower him down which is kind of upside down because you think, if I'm going to go through the ceiling, I need to go up through the ceiling, not down, right? But the truth is, when you know Jesus is the answer, he becomes the issue. And no matter what direction he's in, whether it's this way, whether it's this way, whether it's this way, the ceiling you've got to go through is always in the direction of him. Does that make sense? So they open it up, they lower him down, the dude gets healed. See, this is important because sometimes what happens, two things I think in the story. One is sometimes the crowd of our life is so crazy, we find it so hard to find definition, especially in the Lord, to to get to Jesus to that place enough that everybody's just quiet. You feel like you're just, man, there's just so much going on, you know? Like, I'm a mind racer. I'm always thinking, right? 
sometimes I'm just like, shut up, you know? I'm just like, I just want to like sit here, read a book, which is impossible. And I'm just like, God, give me one paragraph today and I'll serve you forever. Just let me read one and remember it. You know, I'll read, I'll read a whole chapter of a book and not remember anything I just read, right? Usually because I'm thinking 10 directions while I'm reading it. Sometimes the crowd and the noise is so much, we can't get to Jesus by just walking in. We've got to go up on the roof, and we've got to address the ceiling. And to get down to Jesus, two things, they could have, they could have stayed there, but they went down. It's significant that this paralytic was brought above Jesus and then lowered down. Because what that tells me is his breakthrough was actually beneath him. But he had to humble himself, metaphorically speaking, and be brought down, not because Jesus was less than, but because sometimes in our mind we make our sickness whether we realize it or not, our issue, our habit, our brokenness, our despair, sometimes we've got it sitting above Jesus in the way that we think. And so we think, man, no, like God's good, he's amazing, but I, I mean, this sitting from, you know, I mean, I, you know, man, I know he heals people, but somewhere in your mind you don't believe he's going to heal you. Well, man, I know he loves people. I know some people experience things and like worship or they, you know, like, uh, that's awesome for them, but you got this thing here. You think, man, God's like, Jesus is, he's awesome. He's all powerful. But subconsciously, we don't realize sometimes we're putting the thing that we're struggling with, our struggle itself, above where he is. Now, in truth, he's, nothing's ever above him. But then the way that we think, it is. And until we learn to surrender, not perform, because you got to look at the picture of this guy. They're lowering him down, a paralytic. He has zero control on that ride down from the roof. It's not like he can control the speed in which they're lowering him. It's not like he can jump out if things get a little shaky. It's not like if it goes south, he can jump on something. He is completely vulnerable, surrendered, and under the control of someone else to get down to his deliverance. See, the things that we've exalted above the Lord that we don't think he's going to look at, again, for some of us, that's like maybe it's a cycle for 20 years. You've prayed and didn't get breakthrough. But what's happened is because hope deferred makes the heart sick and you didn't get breakthrough so many times or maybe didn't perceive it a certain way. Usually it's because you're hitting a ceiling somewhere and God was trying to show you something you just haven't seen yet. Amen. But it goes on for so long that it becomes our mental culture and subconsciously then we start to never expect breakthrough because it's been so long. And that's where we find ourselves in this posture where the thing that I'm struggling with is a little bit higher than what I believe God wants to do for me. And the only remedy for that is to humble yourself, completely let go, surrender the very thing you're holding on to and be brought down to the feet of Jesus. This is breakthrough. The biggest breakthrough and the why as to we don't see victory in our lives is because we hold on to junk. 